Bible, 1 Thessalonians. Um, we're going to go through 1 Thessalonians during the summer, and then after this, we'll probably get back into Genesis and try to fill it out. But um, when I was thinking about today, does everyone know what today is? It's Sunday, right. Today is Mother's Day. It's found in the Bible. No, it's not found in the Bible. But it, it, it's a day that, uh, that the culture has set aside and, and is a good day. Uh, the Bible says give honor where honor is due. And we definitely want to honor mothers today, especially godly mothers. We're gonna, we've got a gift for you in just a minute. I'm going to have, have some young people come and, and uh, help, help hand the gifts out. But the gift has to do with, with this verse. Um, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Today, we're going to read this in 1 Thessalonians, where Paul commends the Thessalonian church for being imitators of him and imitators of Jesus. And he says their examples, and their example has spread through all of Macedonia. So moms, you, you are a blessing. You are a tremendous example to us. And I'm, for most of the moms I know that in this church, you're, you're a godly example to us. And I think you, you could all take that verse and use it to sanctify you but also to commend you, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, the gift we're giving you is a little compact mirror. And I just want to make sure that you knew that we're not telling you to be vain. We're telling you, every time you look at that, to think of that verse. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. Reflect me in as much as I reflect Christ. So for young people that are going to help me out, I think it's Abriana is one of them, I know. Let's see, Abriana, Reagan, Tim Buckingham, and Gracie. If you guys would come to help me hand these out. And all the moms, I'm going to ask you to stand for just a minute. Because we want to pray for you, we want to acknowledge you. And we want to give you these gifts. So as soon as you get a gift, you can sit down, and that way we'll know everybody's got a gift. So these are all the moms. So, Timmy, if you go to the back, and Adriana, if you go to the back and start on different sides and just work your way up, just give them to every, all the ladies that are standing there. Thank you guys for helping me out so much. So moms, again, we, we want to just express our gratitude, our appreciation, and we want to exhort you to, um, to have the kind of testimony that would say, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. So while they're handing those out, I'm going to pray. So ladies, you can, you can keep your eyes open until you get your gift, and then you have to close your eyes. No, it's, you can pray with your eyes open. Uh, let me pray for you all and just thank the Lord. Father, we do, we do just thank you so much for mothers. Um, Lord, it was no accident that you created, you created human beings in your image. In the image of God, you created them. Male and female, you created them. And Lord, you, you brought them together and you told them to fill the earth with your glory, to be fruitful and multiply. And in that very moment, we have mothers now, mothers who love us, mothers who show us Christ, mothers who are frustrated sometimes and challenged sometimes. And we pray for your grace to be poured out in their lives. We pray, Father, that they wouldn't identify themselves in their failures or shortcomings. But those mothers that are here that know you, they would identify you with you and in you. 
as a mother who knows and loves Jesus Christ, a daughter of the Most High God. And Lord, that they would look to you for the strength and the grace that they need. We're also maybe sensitive and aware that there may be women in the room who would like to be a mother, but you've not opened their womb yet. We pray for them, for encouragement in their hearts, for faith to trust you during, during a time that they might not understand. We know there's people in the room who've lost their mothers, and this is a very sensitive time to them. We pray that you would encourage their hearts and help them. And Lord, help them to think of the ways that their mother displayed you and your glory and reflected you and your love and your kindness in the gospel. Father, thank you again for today. We just give you the praise. Um, we ask you to now prepare us for our time ahead that we would all worship you, singing and praying and listening and obeying the word of God. Do it, Lord, for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Now, would you all please stand? I'm going to read our call to worship this morning from Psalm 99. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. I was buried beneath my rebellion. Lost without hope of redemption Blind to my need for a Savior Oh, but God Crushed by the weight of my failure Living the lie I created Digging my grave without knowing to let me stay lost my salvation sin from heaven nailing my sin to a cross oh my God you gave me a truth worth believing and I traded my chains for your freedom the one that I needed, oh my God, resurrected my heart from the ruins, and my rescue came through like the morning, and this is my short testimony, oh my God, oh my God. in mercy how you love me too much to let me stay alive my salvation sin from heaven nailing my sin to a cross oh my
Did we in our strength? Did we in our own strength combine? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing. Just as to that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, the Lord of hosts, His name, from age to age the same, and He must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. We will not fear, for God hath willed His truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not. 
not for him his rage we can endure for lo his doom is sure one little word shall fail him a mighty fortress a mighty fortress a mighty fortress says our God a mighty fortress a mighty fortress says our God that word to them abide the spirit and the gifts arise through him who with us sided let goods and kindred go this mortal life also the body they may kill God's truth abide is still His kingdom is forever A mighty fortress A mighty fortress A mighty fortress is our God
Join with me in prayer. Father, we bow before you this morning. Jesus, the posture of our hearts bows before you. Holy Spirit of the living God, Will you help us right now as we bow before you and we seek to give you glory and tell you, as the last song did, how worthy you are. There is nothing more worthy of our attention, of our worship, of our affections, of our obedience, than you are. There is none like you. You have always been and you will always be. And we admit that our minds cannot comprehend that. But if there were something higher than you, something that was giving birth to you, O oh God, then we would not be worshiping you. We would be worshiping that thing. And so this morning, we come to a church and we pray to a God who is the sovereign, almighty authority from all of time over all things, over this universe, over this earth, over all. And we're in awe. We can't even comprehend you. And so we long for you to reveal yourself to us. And that is one reason we come here this morning. We want to open up a word, the word, your word. And we want to hear what you have spoken. We want you to guide us. We want you to lead us. We want you to take perhaps a, a, a passage of scripture that we've read before and illuminate it in our lives by the power of the Spirit that we would hear it maybe for the first time in such a way that it is transforming our hearts to worship you. And Lord, we want to come and we want to thank you that you've made a way for us to come through your Son. Jesus Christ came to earth fully human, fully God. 
to die in the place of humans, to take upon himself the punishment for the sins of humanity, and specifically the sins of your church, the sins of your people, that we would be brought into life and brought into your church. Father, we want to acknowledge also how much we need you this morning because we're so fickle. Our hearts are sometimes divided. Our minds are so distracted. Oh God, would you please visit us by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning as your word is read and as your word is explained, as your word is proclaimed. And Lord, transform our hearts. Sanctify us, O God, by your word. Your word is truth. Father, thank you for these people. Thank you for folks that are here this morning. Some are struggling with health issues. Some are struggling with finances. Some are struggling in relationships. And the enemy would have us to to think that, that we're unworthy to be here. We're unworthy to hear what you have to say. But Lord, I thank you for Jesus made a way and we come and we come with ears to hear help us oh God help us to truly worship you we ask for your glory and for our good we pray in Jesus name amen this morning we are going to the letter in the New Testament of First Thessalonians. So if you would go ahead and find that in the New Testament, go through the epistles, and you find first and second Thessalonians. And the first question you might ask is, why did you pick 1 Thessalonians? We're taking a break from Genesis for a season before we go back and try to finish that out, hopefully, in the next section. So why, why 1 Thessalonians? And let me, let me just say, first of all, um, Brother Rod told me that he was going to be preaching from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I was going away last week, and so I wanted to write some devotions um, to read through, and I was almost sure in my head that he said 1 Thessalonians, but he said 2 Thessalonians, and I was trying to get these things written so I could go out of town and see my grandchild, and so I wrote devotions from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And as I was writing, the Lord was encouraging me and blessing me. And, and uh, so I got them all written, and then I realized he's preaching from 2 Thessalonians. So I did something really dumb. I, I did a type over. I had the template Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday from last week, and I typed over. So I would have had those already written, but I messed up and had to rewrite them this week. But... As I was studying, the Lord brought some things to my attention. So that's really, that's really kind of a providential way that we're studying 1 Thessalonians. But then as I was looking through it, I, I wrote down a couple of things of why study 1 Thessalonians. Number one, it's a hopeful letter. And we need hope in these unsettled, dark times that we live in. They needed hope. And so it's a hopeful letter. And you need to hear it. Number two, it clearly teaches how to discern the will of God. It clearly teaches how to discern the will of God. I'm often asked the question, what does God want me to do? Does God want me to take this job? What is God's will for my life? And how we understand the relationship between the Bible, prayer, and the personal guidance of the Holy Spirit is important in the Christian life. The Thessalonians had some of the same thoughts, and Paul addresses how to discern God's will. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, when we get to it. For this is the will of God, your 
sanctification. Your sanctification. So one thing I can tell you for certain, and we, we sometimes bypass that or we don't use that as a guide in our life to discern God's will. First thing is, will this make me more Christ-like? Will it make me holy? Will it make me? And if it's not going to make you Christ-like and it's not going to make you holy, then there's the template. Number three, it will remind us of the proper motivation for gospel ministry. Chapter 2, verse 4. We don't please ourselves through greed or glory or recognition or prominence, but we desire to wholly and entirely please God. Chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Not demanding, not being demanding, but gentle and affectionate or affectionately desirous. Chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Not entitled. It's not about my ministry and my recognition or lazy, but hardworking. Gospel ministry is hard work. It's tiring sometimes. Chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Not founded on the word of men. Gospel ministry is not founded on the ideas of men, but on the word of God. So it will remind us, as we study through it, of the proper motivation for gospel ministry. Number four, it will exhort us towards pouring our lives into others. We are, in my lifetime, probably one of the most entitled generations that I've ever met. It's all about us. Everything's about us. Your Facebook page, it's all about you portraying to everybody else what your, your, your life is like. Your Instagram, it's all about you. This is going to kind of put a burr in your britches, as it were. One of the most powerful expressions in the letter is in 219. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? What will Paul boast about at the coming of the Lord Jesus? And he says this, is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Serving others was Paul what he wanted to do. How can we worship Christ? What is the most valuable to Christ when he returns? What will give him the most glory? Paul says the people he's brought along with him. The people he's poured his life into. Those created in the image of God. Those redeemed by the blood of the Savior. Those are most precious to Paul. It compels the Christian, 1 Thessalonians, this letter, to invest themselves in others for the sake of worshiping Jesus. You ever thought about that? How am I going to worship today? By driving over to this person's house and praying with them, helping them, loving them. Number five. 1 Thessalonians, this letter written to this church, will bring comfort to the grieving. There are many ideas in our culture about what happens when a person dies. Just go to a funeral home viewing and listen. Open your ears. You will hear some of the most far-fetched, far-out ideas of what happens to a person when they die. Some of these unbiblical ideas have made their way even into these very seats before me right now. But Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed. Brothers, about those who are asleep or those who've died. We don't want you to grieve as others do who have no hope. Therefore, a couple of verses later, we want to encourage each other with these words. This is what's going to happen when a, when a person dies, when a Christian dies especially is what he's going to focus. And it's going to help you, I think, bring comfort maybe to the grieving process. And then the last thing here, why should we study 1 Thessalonians? It will press upon us the reality of the second coming as a motivation for holiness and obedience. 
the Lord is coming back. The Holy King is coming back. The Holy King is coming back to collect his holy bride filled with his Holy Spirit. And we've lost sight of that. So those are some reasons. It's a hopeful letter, teaches us to discern the will of God, reminds us of the proper motivation for gospel ministry, exhorts us towards pouring ourselves out into the lives of others, brings comfort to us when we're hurting, grieving, when we've lost a loved one, and it presses upon us the reality of the second coming as a motivation for obedience. Here's a little bit of background about this letter. The author of this letter is found in verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So Paul is the author, but he's including Silvanus, who is Silas. Silvanus is a Latinized version of the word or the name Silas. Um, so Silas is mentioned here. Timothy's mentioned kind of as co-senders as they indicate... Um, as it indicates, Paul's care to present these as a united band and maybe, maybe to offset any disappointment because we're going to read how this church was birthed by Paul and yet he's not been back there to see them. So I want you to know that when I speak, Timothy's speaking. When I speak, Silas is speaking. We all work together. These, these, this is our heart towards you. First Thessalonians was written in A.D. 49 through 51, maybe, somewhere in that time period. Probably in Paul's 18-month stay as he was in Corinth during his second missionary journey. The, the first letter to the Thessalonian church is informal and very personal in style. It was a public letter in the sense of being addressed to a whole group, but at many points it reads more like a personal letter. Paul has a way making them feel like he's directly talking to them, pouring out his love on them. The letter features exuberant expressions of thanksgiving for people who are living the Christian life. Paul gives extended teaching on the second coming of Christ in both letters so that even some of the moral exhortations are related to that doctrine. In other words, one of the reasons you should behave one of the reasons you should walk in holiness is Christ is coming back. He's coming back. Thess Thessalonica was the proud capital of a Roman province of Macedonia. It was probably populated by about 100,000 people at the time. It has a beautiful natural harbor and placement on the busy trade routes, which meant that it was a flourishing center of trade, but also different views, different philosophies that crept in there. And so for a church, they needed to be able to know what God had said. And that's why Paul's writing the letter. It was a free city governed by local officials called politarchs, which are, um, or polytarchs, which are in Acts 17. You'll hear that term. The main religion was the Greco-Roman pantheon, which they had a plurality of these false idols and false gods and also the Egyptian cults had drifted in there. But there was a synagogue in 1 Thessalonians, which, as we will read here in a minute in the book of Acts, um, was Paul's way in to teach in the synagogue there. There was a sizable Jewish population. And uh, like I said, Paul made his way in to teach in the synagogue, first to the Jews and then spread out from there. Let's read the text of Scripture. If you'd stand with me for a moment. First Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and and peace to you. We give thanks to God 
always, for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of uh, reception that we had among you. And now you turn to God from idols, I'm sorry, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son, there's the coming, wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, proclaiming of his word. You might remain seated. I'm going to read another text to you. So if you have your finger in your Bible there, go back to Acts chapter 17. So Acts 17 is the story of how the church began there. Paul has just come from Philippi where he's been in prison. And he gets out of prison and he goes to Thessalonica in Macedonia. So let, let's, let's read that. Um, chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. This is going to give you the backstory of, of this church that he's now written this letter to that we just read chapter 1 of. It says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. They've ended up there. And there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, three consecutive weeks, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Pause for just a minute there. Most scholars believe that because Paul was associated with a Pharisee who was kind of a mentor to Paul, Gamaliel, that Gamaliel's name was known in Thessalonica and so when Paul comes into town, he's allowed to speak in the synagogue there because of his connection with Gamaliel. And he speaks for three weeks. And he takes the Jewish scriptures and he points to Christ, Jesus. I'm going to pick it up in verse 4. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas or Silvanus. There's how his word, his name gets in there. The book of Acts uses the, the, the name Silas, same name, Silvanus or Silvanus. So there's Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews, the devout Jews, the strong Jews, who didn't believe Christ was Messiah, were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and they set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. 
And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silvanus or Silvanus or Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were no more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. And here's where you get Timothy in the mix. But Silas or Savannah, Silvanus and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Chapter 18, verse 1, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, where they now believe Paul writes this letter back to the Thessalonian church. He had to leave abruptly. He's wondering how the church is doing in a, in a cultural plethora of all kinds of ideas. Is the church still even functioning? Is it still even there? What's going on with the church? So he sends Timothy back, and Timothy reports back to him, and that's when he pens this letter, and most people believe it was in Corinth. So Paul, he had to flee there pretty quickly. And you can imagine, if you've, if you've just led a lot of people to Jesus, and they seem really hungry, believing, trusting the Lord, and then you got to leave, you're like, what? How are they doing? I mean, I hate this, but he fled for his life. So where we're headed today in the next couple of minutes, I want you to hear, first of all, the thanks to God that arises simply in Paul's prayer here. Thanks to God arises when we are praying. Sometimes when you're praying and when you're really praying, when the Spirit of God is working in your heart and you've bowed You've set time, you, you have had the spiritual discipline set aside to pray, then God begins to work and thanksgiving begins to fill your life as the Spirit works in you. Number two, thanks to God arises when we recognize His involvement in what the church is doing. That's in verse three there. We'll look at that. Thanks to God arises when we recognize His work in our salvation. That's verse four. And thanks to God arises when his transforming power is observable. He notes that they have been an example, that they have imitated him. Even in the short time that they met him, they've imitated him and Silvanus and Timothy, and they're imitating Christ. And it's, it's spread in such a way that it's, the testimony is flowing through all of Macedonia and even all over the world. They become an example of Christ-likeness, of godliness, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So let's take that first point there. Thanks to God arises when we are praying. And, and, as, and when I read that, verse 2 there, I immediately thought, and some of you ladies, this will be fresh in your minds because you're going through a Bible study in Philippians. Philippians 1, 3 says this, I thank my God... In all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the day, first day until now, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you 
will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. He, he starts into this prayer, and the first thing he thinks about, particularly before he pins this letter, is faces, people, people who have been delivered from idol worship in Thessalonica and brought into the living Christ, the resurrected, living, powerful Christ, and he's seen a transformation in their lives. And as he kneels to pray, faces come into his mind, people. And he begins to thank the Lord for them. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that if you don't have some discipline of prayer or some time when you regularly pray, then this is likely not to happen. This happened when Paul kneeled to pray. I want you to notice that Paul begins to pray and he breaks into this thanksgiving and God brings to mind specifically saints in the church at Thessalonica. Evidently, he also thinks of the saints in Philippi because we've just read it in Philippians as well and likely Rome and Ephesus and Colossae and Corinth and every place he's been. God has brought to Paul's mind plenty of people to pray for. But it started when the discipline of prayer was there. It's personal, too, and it's specific. Look at the term there, all of you. It's the Greek word pasa. It means all, every, the whole, thoroughly. He's thinking through this church, and he's praying specifically for, for people there that have been transformed by the gospel. Practically. And I thought about this. Most of you get one of these. They're at the Welcome Center. Diane mails them out. It's a membership directly, directory. Sometimes it probably goes in the trash. Sometimes it goes up on a shelf. And you have to call somebody. Their phone numbers are here. Their email address is here. Uh, information about where they live is here. But have you ever thought about this document right here? Taking it for a couple of minutes a day, working your way through it. Saying, Lord, would you please encourage Andrew Atherton and his family? And then he gives you a template here. Do you see the template in verse 2? The template is thinking through the evidence of faith in Andrew and Alina and Eason and Oakley, thinking through the works of faith or the works that come from their faith, and thanking God for them. Taking a few minutes. And then you go to David Baker and his family. And then you go to Scott and Teresa Berrio. And, then, and, 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 and you take this and take three names a day, three names a day, begin to pray and say, Lord, show me. Help me to think through, to think through what I know about their life. And these might be people you don't even know yet, right? Like it's a pretty big church. You don't know people intimately, every person in this building. So where you can't think of a work of faith, you ask God to demonstrate the faith they have in you through the way they help people today, through the way that Alina might greet a neighbor or take the boys to a baseball game, and interact with the other moms there. See how personal it gets? I think that's what Paul was thinking. Now, he didn't have a membership directory, and he didn't have Diane, right? But, but it's just making it real easy and practical for us right here to just take this directory that many of you just toss over here till you need a recipe for bran muffins or something, and then you... Yeah, who is that lady that makes those good brand muffins at the and you look them up and you call or whatever? It's more than that. This is a tool, an instrument that God gives you. It's practical. Practical. Could it be that we take this daily and pray for three to five families every day? What do you think would happen? If it was real prayer, was God really working? What would happen in our lives? Like, bring it on. Pray for me. <laughs> I'll take all the prayers you can give me. 
And, 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 and again, we're going to look here a little closer at that template, but what would happen if we would lift our brothers and sisters up to the sovereign creator of all things? Look at the next phrase, constantly, constantly mentioning you. And I think there, the, the constantly is the whole church. I'm mentioning you in our prayers. That, that, that word is a Greek word that I'm not going to try to pronounce, but I'll tell you the meaning. It means uninterruptedly, without ceasing, without intermission, incessantly, constancy. Now, you say, I just don't have the time. I really don't have the time, Brother Pastor. I, that's a great idea, but you don't know my busy schedule. And I would ask you back, how much time do you spend looking at your phone? Looking at your personal device. How much time do you spend on the gossip on Facebook? The perfect lives of those on Instagram? How much time do you spend on the foolishness of TikTok videos? How much time have you wasted on YouTube this week? Paul suggests a way to use time here. I thank my God every time I'm in prayer and I think of you and I do it with constancy. I do it with intentionality. I do it. I put aside my phone. I leave it over there. I shut the ringer off and I'm going to spend time praying and I'm going to take the membership directory. My brothers and sisters need God's spirit at work in their life. They need God's power. We need His grace to stand in this wicked generation that's pushing in on every side. And He even shares with us what our focus toward God should be in this prayer time. Thanks to Him. Thanks to God for you. Thanking God for you all. This thanks to God arises up in Paul, number one, because he's taken the time to pray. And as his heart is welling up with thanks, people's names, people's faces come to mind. People's faith being worked out. And as he sits here in Corinth and he's praying and he's praying often for this church at Thessalonica, it becomes a discipline. It becomes a habit. It becomes something regular, constant, practice. God impresses him when he's in this discipline of people and he prays for people and he thanks God for their work. Number two, thanks to God arises when we recognize his involvement in what the church is doing. Verses two and three, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering, this is what he's thanking God for, remembering before our God the Father, look at, this, look at the words, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the Lord. Works that come from faith. Not, 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 not works that, that justify you, but works that show you are justified. Works from faith. And he says it's your works. And that's like me, that's like me going to Aaron and Jen. And, and Jen does something for me, and I go and thank Aaron, right? When you first read this, it's like, why, why are you thanking Aaron? It doesn't make sense unless it's God here. He's thanking, I'm thanking the Lord for what Jen did, but I'm thanking the Lord. It was her work, she did it, and yet it was his work in her that made her do it. So, so just think about that for a minute. Do you see the works of faith in the saints at Pleasant View? Have you taken any time to think about it? Do you see the people gathering in Terra Alta, giving of their time, meeting with people who are from there, who aren't here this morning because they're from there. They're giving of their time, their effort, believing by faith that God is going to use his word, their love, their lives, 
to somehow influence these people in Terra Alta to see Jesus more clearly and to come to faith believing in Him. Do you see the stay-at-home moms in this church who as a working out of their faith raise, raise their children with the love of Jesus Christ, trusting, believing in faith that His work in and through her will impact her children for the Lord Jesus. That's one we don't hear much about, is it? Like, like, like it gets down to the nitty gritty. Like some of you moms that stay at home that think you're insignificant because there are other ladies that are working or, or you can't be as involved in certain things because you are raising children. But you are a work of faith to us. We see that. And we need to take time to thank God for that and ask God to energize you in that. Or how about this one? Do you see people obeying Christ in faith and giving of their time to demonstrate His love and encouragement to people like Hop and Judy Cassidy? Like while I was away last week, I just learned that some of you went over there They're unable to do some of the yard work that they used to be able to do. And as a work of faith, believing believing that God is going to use this, maybe their neighbors saw it. You don't know how God's going to use it, but in faith, you went over there and you took out some old shrubs and you planted some new shrubs and you you did some mulching and you, you beautified this place. It's a work of faith. It's not only the missionary that's over there risking their lives. Obviously, that's a work of faith. But it's all over the place. You just got to look for it. You got to thank God for it. How about a labor of love? Well, Well, let me go one more. Do you see the people of this church working various jobs day in and day out as unto the Lord? Sometimes tedious jobs. Sometimes they're put in a place of hardship. With, with pressure on them to compromise. But as a work of faith, they get up and they do that job. Let me ask you, are you in a job where you lost sight that this should be unto the Lord? Faith as unto the Lord. I'm working as unto the Lord, not this boss who's being a complete numbskull. That's a Three Stooges word. But I'm doing it as unto the Lord. It's faith. But brothers and sisters, we'll never think through these things and we'll never see these things unless we really have some sort of way asking the Lord to bring people to our remembrance, using things like a church membership directory to bring people up so we think through and we pray through and it's it's beautiful and it's special. And I want you to see Paul's heart in this. It's really powerful. So look around. Thank God for the work of faith. Look around. Thank God for the labor of love. Consider, consider, my brothers. I had a sweet time with our deacons on Tuesday night as we gather together and we spend time praying for you and talking about you and how we can serve you and how we can love you and how we can keep people from, from falling through the cracks here to reach out to them. We spent a lot of time doing that. That's a labor of love. That's a labor. That's, that's, that's work. It, it takes out of their time that they could be doing other things, but they're, they're doing it because they think you're worth it. They love you, and they are willing to labor for you. Labor in prayer, labor in effort, labor in the gospel, or our elders, or our trustees, or our Sunday school teachers. Or the people that sit, set up and tear down at a church picnic or at a dinner we're having. They, why do they do that? Well, I hope they do it because it's a labor of love. There's a spiritual giftedness that God's given to certain people in serving. We're all supposed to serve. But, but do you recognize these things? Do you recognize that church picnics don't just happen? I mean, I guess they can. Like, like, but if we never told anyone to bring food and 
if Diane didn't send out those agonizing lists of who's bringing what and who's coming and that kind of thing, and oh, yeah, yeah, we're just free-going, entitled people. We don't need to answer back those things. Listen, that's a labor of love on Diane's part to make sure everything goes smoothly here. It's a labor of love when people stay afterwards and make sure the place is put back after we do stuff like that. Do you recognize that? Do you thank God for it? And how about this steadfastness that comes from hope in the Lord Jesus Christ? The people who have gone through tremendous suffering in this church and yet believe with everything in them that these light momentary afflictions are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What about those people? Those people who have lost loved ones, those people that are going through cancer, that are, they're going through health issues, but you never hear them complaining. You always hear them talking about hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, they, and they'll quote verses like, to live is Christ, to die is gain. This thing isn't going to kill me. God's going to take me when it's time for him to take me. And you, and you, walk them, you, you watch them walk through these things with resolve and, and with, with godly Stamina and perseverance. It's a steadfastness of hope. They don't get discouraged. Let me tell you, if, if you're watching CNN news or any of the news things, for long periods of time, you won't have a steadfastness of hope. You'll be ready to jump off a cliff. Because there is no hope in any of that. But there is hope in the Lord. There's hope that even in these dark times, He's going to use the church. To shine the, the light all the brighter in this world. Number three, thanks to God arises when we recognize his work in our salvation. Lest you, lest we begin to idolize people that are displaying works of faith, people that are showing labor of love, people that are really showing us a steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants to set the record straight. Look at verse 4. For we know, brothers, loved by God, you're beloved of God or beloved by God or loved by God, that He has chosen you. Now, the New King James Version renders it like this. Knowing this, beloved brethren, your election by God. This is talking about election. This is talking about the root, the why people have have this work of faith or faith that comes by works, labor of love or love that comes or, or is displayed through, through laboring and the steadfastness of hope. We know, brothers. We know, Thessalonian believers, even though I didn't get to spend much time with you as the Apostle Paul, I know something about you. I know, I, 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 I'm writing to see how you're doing, but here's, here's the steadfastness of steadfastness of hope I have, I know that you are loved by God. Well, that's a very special term there that Paul uses. For God so loved the world, but he also says in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives. And here's what it's a picture of. As Christ specifically has set his belovedness on the church. Like, I love all the women in this church right now, but i got to qualify that. I show a unique and special love to one woman in this church. It's my wife. And I think that's the same thought that Paul's giving here. You're loved in a special way. Thessalonians, you're different than, than all the other people in Thessalonica. God has set his love on you. He has chosen you. And the reason the Thessalonians are doing the works of faith, the labor out of love and displaying a confident steadfastness, perseverance, and the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ flows out of God's specific love and choice for them. Listen, it's spoken again in Ephesians. Listen to this. For by grace you have been saved through faith... And this is not 
of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Listen to this verse. Here's the one I want you to hear. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it's a, it's a beautiful prayer here. He, he is thanking God specifically for their work, your work of faith. But he tells them then why their work of faith is happening. Their labor of love is happening. Their steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ is happening because God has set his special love on you. He saved you. He's elected you. It's his choice. And that, it, so it doesn't surprise Paul. Now the red flags are flying in everybody's head, right? Does it really say that? This electing love of God that's effectual, it has, a, it has a purpose, it works in us so that it flows out in all of these things. Well, keep reading. Because that that's a snag in our minds. We hesitate there. We think through that. We wonder about that. Thanks to God arises when his transforming power is observable. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you. How, do we, how does Paul know? How can Paul confidently say to the Thessalonians, God has chosen you? How? how? He sees it. Look. Because our gospel came to you not in word, not only in word. Every week you hear the gospel. People sit in these seats and every person hears the same thing, right? How many gospel proclamations have you heard in your lifetime? How many, how many has your boss who doesn't believe in Jesus, who doesn't want to believe in Jesus, who hates Jesus... How many has he heard in his lifetime? No one knows, right? So how do you know if someone's chosen? Because they hear the gospel proclaimed, but it's not only in word, but it's also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. So something happens. It's more than just hearing the gospel. It's more than just mentally acknowledging there was a Jesus. Yes, he died on the cross. Yes, he went to the grave. Yes, he rose again. I believe that. Therefore, I'm saved. Something is different here. Paul is saying, I know that you're chosen by God because you heard the word and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit transformed you in full power and with conviction. And then he goes on to say, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. I mean, we were fleeing. We were fleeing out of a place where we spent some time in jail in Philippi, and we and we came, we were running from there to get to you. And we came, and he's going to talk about that later. How we weren't a burden to you. We weren't trying to use you. We weren't trying to make up something and mooch off of you. We actually worked among you. And he says, you know what kind of men we were. You know our reputation. You know our, our, our proclamation matched our lifestyle, our, our talk matched our walk. And you became imitators of us. But you can't stop there. And of the Lord. Remember, 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, Paul says, imitate me inasmuch as I'm imitating Jesus. Don't imitate me when I'm not imitating Jesus. That's what I would say in the negative. But in the positive, it's imitate me or follow me as I am following Christ. So, so how do we know someone's chosen? Because they hear the gospel. They're transformed by the gospel. There's conviction that works itself out in a repentance and a change of life in the gospel. And then they, they imitate godly people. And first and foremost, they imitate the Lord. They are Christ-like. They are godly. They, they, they pursue holiness. And that's how we know. 
You don't know, apart from you know, any other way, you don't know. This is the way you can assume, you can know that someone is beloved by God, chosen by Him, by the way they live out their life. That's what he's saying. Follow me as, in as much as I'm following Christ. Paul says that the Thessalonian believers are imitators of the Lord. And, and look at it. Go on and look at it. And even when it is hard, like some people throw in the towel when the persecution starts. Some people throw in the towel when it's against the law. Some people throw in the towel when they, they get sick or something and they start to blame God. But, but the evidence of this pushes right through much affliction and not just much affliction, but in that affliction, having joy of the Holy Spirit so that they're an example to all. Let me remind you again that Paul is in the midst of a bursting out prayer of thanksgiving to God for this work in you all, or specifically to the Thessalonians, but you all, for me, for Pastor Mark, for our elders, for our deacons, when we pray for you, look for stuff like this. We stop going to God with all of our little Christmas wish lists and we begin to go back and we, we think through people's lives and how they need prayer. We want to see them live for the glory of God so that Christ's name is known to Garrett County, to, to all the areas. And we pray for this. Somehow, in God's sovereignty, He allows our praying to have an influence on this. Isn't that amazing that He would even let you in on that? But you got to pray. If you don't pray, none of this is going to happen. You got to pray. So, let me just sum it up by saying this Where do most often people see the work of God? You could say creation. But there's some people that look at his creation every day. They don't believe there's a God, right? I would say that Paul's saying to this church and to our church that most often we see the work of God through his people. Through his church. Through those whom he has redeemed to himself and given the, the same old strategy to image forth his glory. In Christ. Where do most often we see the work of God? We see it in works that come from faith. We see it in labor that comes from love. We see it in steadfastness that comes from hope. So my challenge as I end to myself, Mark and I have been talking about this. And one thing I was just going to see I'm going to say it publicly so you can hold us accountable, but on a daily basis that he and I would get together and just pray through the membership directory. A few names at a time. A few minutes a day. Pray. Pray. Because it's God who's doing this powerful work among you, and I want to be thankful for that in you. I want to thank my God when I think of you. So brothers and sisters, I'm well aware that this is mostly for the church this morning. But maybe there's someone here that doesn't know Christ. I want you to hear this prayer and I want you to see that what you long for is the transforming power of Jesus to bring you back to the creator, the one that made you so that you can joyfully serve him. And know his son, Jesus Christ. So that you can be empowered with the Holy Spirit of the living God. To live in such a way that fulfills your purpose. So Father, I pray and I, I ask you first of all that you would just stir this church to be a praying church. That in our private prayer times we would pray like Paul prayed. Lord, that we would pray for one another and we would take special note to thank you for the works of faith that we see in individuals in this church. For the labors of love that we see in people at this church. And for the beautiful steadfastness of hope, even in the midst of 
affliction, even in the midst of dark times, that people have in this church, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray that you, by your your spirit, would work on their heart, drawing them to yourself. If we can share with them from the word what it means to know you, how, how all of this works, then Lord, would you please break every humble thought or reason in their mind and help them to talk to somebody about this that will open up the word, bring them to Christ. Lord, we love you today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. We bless you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Out of the depths I cry to you, in darkest places I will call, incline your ear to me anew, and hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sinful ways, how could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze, I stand redeemed by grace alone. I will wait for you, I will your word I will rely I will wait for you surely wait for you till my soul is satisfied so put your hope in God alone Take courage in his power to save completely and forever one by Christ emerging from the grave. Paid the price 
that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice that all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice i will wait for you i will wait for you through the storm and through the night i will wait for you surely wait for you for your love is my delight i will wait for you i will wait for you through the storm and through the night i will wait for you surely wait for you for your love is my church. And as a benediction from Philippians 4, go in the grace of the Lord, hearing these words, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Love on your mother if she's still with you today. That goes for all of us. Honor the Lord with your lives. Walk in the Spirit. Be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us today.